Uh, it's good to see everyone. I'm going to be talking today a little bit about security and client-side security, which is a little bit scary and probably boring for a lot of people. And so hopefully I can twist it in a way that, that makes it at least somewhat interesting. I was going to do uh, this in Spanish, but I was worried I would make a mistake and then I would be muy embarazada. <laughs> it means pregnant. Um, not enough Spanish speakers. Uh, anyways, uh, security. So security is kind of scary. It comes along with a lot of baggage. And when developers see the word security or client-side security or something like that, they think to themselves, security is very important. Someone who knows about security should take a look at all this code I'm writing. Kind of push it away from, from their jobs and outside to someone else who's you know, a security person. Uh, and I think part of that has to do with like the crazy amount of acronyms that, that are used in uh, security. So there's like CSP, SRI, CSRF, XSS, CORS, HSTS. This is enough. Like, I could keep going. But I'll get started with an analogy, I think, uh, for, for how I see security best practices actually reaching uh, real developers, actual real life developers, uh, and why maybe like good security hasn't necessarily caught on. Uh, so I work at Stripe. Uh, Stripe is a payments company for the web, uh, which is in California uh, in the United States, uh, San Francisco specifically, but I live in Texas. Uh, we had another speaker from Texas, Texas uh, representing well. Texas has a lot of nicknames. A lot of them are not so nice, but one of them is the Lone Star State. And Texas has a lot in common with the web. Uh, one of those things is uh, that they both are referred to as the Wild West, um, just unrelated to what I'm talking about. Anyways, in 1985, Texas had a problem. Uh, Texas had a lot of problems in 1985, but we'll go with uh, littering. Uh, and you might not think that littering is something that anyone would, you know, fight for the, you know, the right to litter, but. Uh, at the time, some Texans defended their God-given right to litter. So it was a real thing. There were fines for littering that, that they did. So you, you, some of you, if you've been to Texas, might recognize this sign. This is uh, pretty common, even in other states as well. But that didn't do anything. No one seemed to care. And the state tried some slogans. Uh, one of those slogans uh, was, uh, keep Texas beautiful. Uh, which uh, is really, you know, it's like flowers and it's pretty and blue. And it's like, hey, all you people who are defending your right to litter, uh, respond to this nice, pretty picture and this slogan. And like, won't this make you stop littering? So they might as well just add like, pretty please with the cherry on top, keep Texas beautiful. Uh, so these slogans did not resonate with the people who were doing the littering. Uh, and so they did some research and the people who were doing the littering uh, they, uh, they recognize as Bubba's in pickup trucks, males 18 to 24. Uh, and this is like the core demographic of people who were throwing trash on the side of the road. And so in 1985, this is, uh, what was that, 30 years ago? Um, Mike Blair and Tim McClure of GSDNM, they do like the Mercedes uh, advertising, they're, they're a big advertising firm uh, in Austin. Uh, where I'm from, and they teamed up with the Texas Department of Transportation, uh, and they created a slogan, an anti-littering campaign called, Don't Mess With Texas. And you might have heard, Don't Mess With Texas, it's in songs, it's in like movies, and, and all this kind of thing. It's like a popular phrase, and a lot of people don't know that it's actually an anti-littering campaign. Uh, but it worked. Like, they reached their core audience of like these prideful people who like, we are defending Texas by not allowing you to litter. It, it became something. And, and uh, they reduced litter on Texas highways by 72%. Uh, I, I wrote that down, I created that slide, and then I thought to myself, whose job is it to measure litter on the side of the highway? <laughs> and why don't they just pick it up? So my point is, uh, with security, uh, hey, everyone, pretty please, will you please make your website secure because it's important uh, and it's the right thing to do, probably isn't going to be the 
thing that convinces us all uh, to be secure. It has to be something that's a default, something that's built in, and something that we're prideful about and we want to do because uh, we feel strongly about it. Uh, and one of the ways that I can make you feel strongly about it is realize, help you realize how uh, hopeless that you are. Uh, there is no hope in security. You can never win. Uh, you can patch a thousand holes and someone only has to find one. So we can also discuss how the web is evolving to uh, kind of fight against that model. Uh, I also wanted to note that uh, don't mess with XSS. <laughs> Probably won't work either. Uh, the key here is that web developers, not security people, are the core audience of security research. Uh, and it seems like this external security people, but it, like, it's all of your jobs to uh, make your applications secure by default. Uh, and web security is hard. Uh, I think Mike West uh, once said, all you have to do is never make a single mistake. Uh, which, <laughs> he's not wrong. Um, uh, I think he summarized this by uh, uh, everyone has deadlines. So Alex Russell uh, also said, I discount the probability of perfection. So if you look at all you have to do is never make a single mistake, and then discounting the probability of perfection, you can guess that you're probably going to have some security uh, flaws in your application. The core way that security flaws uh, occur is uh, via content injection. It's not the, the reason for them, but the, the way they manifest themselves is in content injection. And so the type of content is, uh, it could be anything, it's usually a script, uh, and that's kind of what we're talking about today. But it doesn't have to be, it could be images or flash or CSS, uh, it can be anything. Uh, and Content injection sounds scary and weird, but this is all it is. So you have a template. This is handlebars, old handlebars. Um, and you have some loop, and you're injecting content from some database. And inside of there, uh, you're just spitting out content. And if you notice, I use the three, uh, the three bracket handlebar thing because by default, handlebars escapes. Uh, let's say the content was supposed to be HTML. Uh, and in this case, some jerk puts a script tag into our list of items, and then this is what comes out. And this is a classic uh, XSS attack. So I put a script tag where you didn't expect it. You put that script tag onto your page, and now my script runs every time someone loads that page. That's content injection. Um, uh, everyone always has a friend that picks a script alert as their username for your demo, uh, like chat app. I think at AustinJS, our local meetup, every time someone demos a chat app, within the first 30 seconds, 10 people log in to the chat app, and all of them are script tags as names. That's a jerk. Uh, one, one such friend, uh, th this is my user agent. Uh, and, and side note, uh, that's crazy. User agents are actually crazy. Uh, anyone know what browser that is? It's, uh, it's obviously Mozilla Apple WebKit Gecko Chrome Safari. Uh, but anyways, that's my user agent. It's probably similar to yours if you use Chrome. Uh, this is my friend Mike Taylor's user agent, which seems pretty similar. But if you look closer, <laughs> he added that. And I first thought, I was like, that's brilliant, because your user agent gets sent on like every request and things like that. But then I realized that it doesn't like it displayed back to you. He's really only like trolling logging software and like, What's my user agent sites, I guess? I don't know. Anyways, this is Sammy. <laughs> Sammy, uh, uh, we, we won't focus too much on Sammy, but Sammy uh, uh, is, is a good, uh, he's good at hacking. Um, and he wrote something called the Sammy Computer Worm. Uh, and uh, it was JS Space Hero is what like Norton Antivirus uh, did it. Uh, called it. And really all he did is he found an XSS vulnerability in MySpace, and he made MySpace, if you went to his page, it would automatically friend him, and then it would write on your like wall or whatever MySpace had, uh, and it would say, Sammy is my hero, and then it would inject that same code into your page. And so anytime visit, someone visited your page, it would also friend Sammy. And overnight, he became the second most popular person on MySpace behind Tom, obviously. Not Tom Dale, which I'm sure he was third at the time. 
Uh, and that was the Sammy's my hero. Uh, actually, interesting story is that uh, he was uh, then like arrested under the USA Patriot Act and uh, and plead guilty to a felony charge and wasn't allowed to use a computer for three years. Yay! <laughs> for friending people on MySpace, that's crazy. Uh, actually, though, I recently found out that the way that that actually went down, and uh, this is t again totally unrelated, is that uh, they offered him a job. That, like MySpace said, hey, come out to San Francisco and interview. And then when he got off the plane in San Francisco, cops were waiting for him and they arrested him. So if you ever hack anyone, don't then accept a job from them. <laughs> Unless you're really sure. Uh, Sammy uh, wrote something after his three-year probation called Evercookie. Uh, and what Evercookie does is it, uh, is it uses uh, you know, cookies to store data, and then the next time you visit the web page, you can get that information back. But in case someone cleared their cookies, it also uses like flash cookies, and also Silverlight storage, and also CSS history knocking, and e-tags, and web cache, window name, user data. It uses like Java uh, exploits, and uh, pretty much it stores your information everywhere. No matter how you try to kill it, it'll go away. There, there's an FAQ on the page uh, and says, uh, how do I stop websites from doing this? Great question. So far, I found that using private browsing in Safari will stop all Evercookie methods after a browser restart. I also found one other method, uh, which is just setting your computer on fire and buying a new one. This has actually been mostly cleaned up. One nice thing about Evercookie is uh, for a little while it was scary and all the ad agencies started using it, uh, yeah, ad networks started using it, uh, but then browsers had like a, a system to test against to say, are we vulnerable to Evercookie? And, and they've mostly cleaned things up. But uh, like that's an instance of like a hack that you don't realize can, can follow you around. So let's just detect malicious scripts. All we have to do is you know, find something that's you know, accessing something we don't like or, or doing something like that. Uh, so we start writing scripts differently. So like here's a script that we could write. Uh, and that's valid JavaScript. Um, and uh, obviously everyone knows that that's just alert one. So, you can detect malicious scripts. You just have to uh, be able to know that that's malicious, right? Um, so not, not quite the best plan, detecting malicious scripts. Sure, it couldn't hurt, but you're not going to be able to do it well. One of my favorite uh, examples of not being able to detect malicious scripts is uh, this one. Uh, this is a pretty good hack. It's from Billy Hoffman. He introduced it in, in 2010 at JSConf. And there it is. That's the code. That's the malicious code right in between those two script tags. Uh, uh, tab space, tab tab space, and that's uh, you know eight bit um, characters that are then evaled back into JavaScript, uh, ones and zeros, if you will. Uh, and so you have a block that is just an empty script tag to you inside of your view source window, and that's now malicious code. So you cannot detect malicious code. What if we just try to get rid of the ability to inject script tags? So you could output, uh, take your output, and at the very end, just kill all the script tags and, and remove them all. Um, and this would be cool, but you can inject content lots of different ways. There's, you know, the onload property. Your links can have JavaScript URLs instead of uh, regular URLs. There's, there's lots of things. But let's say you were actually uh, just convinced all your users to turn JavaScript off entirely. Now you can't hack me, right? So we can talk about CSS hacks, more content injection. So the most popular CSS hack is called uh, like link knocking. Uh, and you know how whenever you have been to a link, it's purple. And if you uh, haven't, it's blue. Um, well, that re reveals a lot of information. So I can just you know, inject, uh, say, 300 million URLs onto your page, and then check the color of them all, and then see what sites you've been to, like the top 300 million sites would, would be a good start there. Uh, and, and that sounds pretty like harmless, like how many could you do in a second? But uh, some people did some pretty scary things with Google searches. Uh, if you know you're in Chrome, you know the, the likelihood, or like the, the set of parameters that Chrome injects into a Google search whenever you use like the awesome bar up top. And so you can then just inject a bunch of different Google searches. And what someone did is they, they put in like scary health things, like uh, dealing with cancer or uh, 
going into debt or something like that, something that you might search for if you have a problem, and then they just enumerated a bunch of different versions of those, and they could more or less reliably find out if you would ever search for uh, treatments for different diseases, and then they said, what if your healthcare provider could do this? So it's totally a real thing that could actually really happen and really affect people. Uh, I know healthcare is not necessarily a good example in Spain, but bear with the Americans. Uh, so the visited selector uh, is actually uh, changed now in most newer browsers. More or less, they, they fixed it uh, by saying, uh, we're just going to lie to you about the color of links, uh, which is cool. Uh, like, it, it's pretty difficult, because you have to also do like child selectors and all those types of things. Um, and so let's say, like, let's, let's consider that fixed. But then we can add another hack into the mix. And this is called uh, a timing attack. And timing attacks haven't traditionally been something that uh, have been very possible uh, on, uh, in browsers because uh, timers in browsers suck really bad. Uh, so I call that security by inaccuracy. Uh, but a timing attack uh, really comes down to, like the, the most famous timing attack is uh, password checks. So if my password is password123 and I check that uh, against the, the, the password you typed in, and I just ch check P against you know, whatever word you typed in, and the first letter fails, and I say, no, this is a failure. And then you type a letter that starts with P, and it takes a little bit longer for it to fail. And then I can actually like, figure out, like, the longer it takes for you to fail, the more I know that my password is correct. And people can you know, backwards figure out passwords from that. So that's traditionally up impossible. But now we have this new cool thing called Quest Animation Frame. It's a very reliable timer in browsers. Uh, and we also have the visited selector uh, from before. But it's going to lie to you about what color it is. So you can't necessarily get changed information from it if someone's doing that. Uh, but you can get something just as valuable. So let's say we added a really gross drop shadow, text shadow, to our text. Uh, and here's the hack. Do you see? Do you, do you feel it yet? Uh, this is a powerful hack. It's just, it convinces you via hypnosis to type in your password. What's actually happening is that this takes less than 16 milliseconds to render, and this takes well over 60 milliseconds to render because it's hard for GPUs to, to render drop shadows. Uh, and so the only way that we could fix this is if we just made all things render more slowly, and that's never going to happen. Uh, and so you can actually pretty reliably still use the CSS knocking technique, but now at least uh, it takes a lot longer. Like, it's a lot more computationally expensive, uh, and you have to like, be on a page. But that I don't think will ever go away. So let's move on. Uh, JSON-P is a something that you use. Uh, it's called JSON with padding. Uh, I say JSON, some people say JSON. Um, and Douglas Crockford, who created it, uh, finally weighed in on it a, a few years back. And he was a jerk and said it's pronounced JSON. Not a cool move. Anyways, I like to call JSON P JSON pretty insecure. Nailed it. Uh, hey, I'd really like it if someone could run arbitrary dynamic scripts on my page. I'm a JSON P user. Anyways, whenever you do this, this is a you know, JSON P request. It feels like Ajax. It feels like you're doing a request to a different thing. But really, all that happens is you inject a script on your page, and the content of that can have dynamic data that comes back. And that, that's kind of this cross-domain hack that's beautiful and like, helped the web grow. But it's also like you're allowing someone to just run dynamic arbitrary code on your page. Uh, and so like, what could they do? What if the callback, the, the script that they injected looked like this? So you go grab the social security number out of the page, make a request real fast with that number in it, and then I'll still give you your information back. And so it actually feels like things are still working just fine, but also I'm stealing, siphoning off all these social security numbers. Um, just don't deal with social security numbers in general. Uh, so you should probably use cores. That's not a real Tumblr, by the way. People get mad at me uh, whenever I show this. I should change that. Not a real Tumblr. Maybe I'll make the Tumblr. Someone make, you should probably use cores.tumblr.com. Well, anyways, we got to go. Uh, Cross-origin resource sharing. Cross-origin resource sharing. That's cores. Uh, so use headers in order to like whitelist different domains that you're willing to talk to, and that's maybe a better solution than JSONP for uh, 
for talking cross domain. This is a real website you can go to, and it'll help you figure out how to enable it in different servers. Uh, so just protect against JS and script tag injections and CSS injections, uh, and, and you're good, right? Uh, so let's talk about CSRF a little bit. CSRF is something that, that we could talk about. It's a little bit of a server-side uh, security measure, but it, it really stops people from being able to like load a page from a different website just as an iframe and then like have that page do an action for you. Like other people can't like things on Facebook for you by just loading up the the URL that you, is requested whenever you make a like. So this CSRF value is pretty crappy. It's only four characters. But imagine if I was able to inject CSS anywhere into your page that looks something like this. Uh, you know, if there's a value of 0001, then a request will be fired off for uh, this image that may or may not exist or anything. And then I could enumerate that a couple times, maybe three times, or maybe like, say, two million times. And then I have two million attempts at figuring out your CSRF token. I can just watch that server log. And if one of them ever gets requested, I have a bunch of information about your IP address and all these things, and then I also have your CSRF uh, token. Uh, and you say, that's huge, uh, but all of you ship two megabyte mobile apps, right? Um, and so gzips, this is like core use case for gzip. It's like really great for gzip. And it gets worse than that. Uh, the, the worst possible world is where you actually do all of the security protections that you're supposed to. You stop content injection, you do all that stuff, you've actually done everything right, and then browser vulnerabilities can still uh, get you in the end. So there's this white paper a few years back. A lot of this has been somewhat cleaned up, but not entirely, but it's also a little bit infeasible, but it could become more and more feasible. So uh, it's uh, cross-domain data snooping with SCG filters and OCR, which is its own talk title, I think. They probably actually did give a talk. So let's say you injected an iframe, and then you're able to put an SVG filter over it that uh, kind of grabbed contrast. And so now you can have an SVG that represents the page behind it. So you kind of have an image of the iframe behind you, uh, and then you can use OCR to, you know, image to text and then grab text out of the page. And so even if this person uh, didn't do anything wrong, then I can still grab words out of there. And, and one of the things that was tough was like different fonts and different locations and like how do you OCR that well. And what someone figured out is you can actually load up the view source URL and you get the perfect, you know, like code source background. You know it's gonna be 14 point uh, consolas sans or something. Uh, I wonder what they used. Anyways, that sucks. We need a new approach and that approach uh, is called content security policy, CSP. Uh, and recently, uh, one of the people who works on it announced that she wants to change the name uh, to increase CSP adoption. Like I said, there are a lot of acronyms. They're renaming it to BATSHIELD. Back acronym, Trustworthy, Secure, Internet Enabled, Lightweight Defense. And if you look lower, she forgot the H in the, <laughs> added it later, it means helper. Uh, she drew this helpful diagram uh, for it. So BATSHIELD. Uh, is what we're talking about today, not CSP, uh, which is, I think, great. It's much better. CSP is a header. It looks a little bit like this. Obviously, not as many dots. Uh, but what it allows you to do is, uh, by default, more or less lock everything down entirely. Like, you can't even do anything on your own page, your own self, except for render HTML. And then it lets you open up little holes for the things that you want to use, and hopefully only those things. So by default, it disallows inline JS and CSS. So if anyone's able to like, inject that content, it won't even run. Uh, it also disallows eval. So even if they inject that white space stuff, there's no way for them to like, render that, or eval that white space, white, white space stuff anywhere. Uh, it disallows all cross-domain JavaScript, CSS, image, fonts, et cetera, like Swift files. And so even if you're able to inject CSS and match a CSRF, that image is on a different domain and it's not uh, in the right rule set, and so that person never gets your CSRF. And it also uh, allows you to report violations. And so anytime there is a violation, a URL gets hit that says, like, this was violated by this IP address at this time, blah, 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 uh, and you can kind of follow up those. It's a little bit of a mess because all of your browser plugins uh, all violate um, the, the CSP almost universally, and so it's really noisy output, but if you, like, can filter it well enough, it's kind of nice. 
So the key is that this is a whitelist. It's the opposite of saying, I want to try to figure out all the possible hacks and then prevent each of them individually. What it says, I want to prevent everything, like even good stuff, and then I want to just open up the little things that I need to do. Uh, and some of that kind of stinks because uh, like it's good performance to load your CSS uh, inline to the top of the page for the critical render path. So, so what do you do for that? And that's why CSP2 is, uh, it's, it's kind of out, it's, not, it's in some browsers, but not all of them yet. Um, and it allows you to put like integrity hashes. So uh, it says, it's fine to run this inline CSS as long as it matches this hash output. And so it allows you to whitelist specific pieces of uh, CSS or JavaScript that you are allowed to inline, but generic uh, things wouldn't be as possible. Uh, and I think that's, that's really good. It also has nice graceful degradation from CSP1, uh, which is cool, but I won't go into. There are some pages that you can learn more about content security on. CSP is awesome. Uh, .com is a good one. Uh, there are tools that you can integrate with. Uh, Helmet is one for Express that'll just help you inject like all these kind of security headers uh, into there. Uh, if you use like Ember, there's Ember CLI content security policy, which is built into Ember CLI by default. Uh, and so if you use Ember CLI, you'd actually have to actively turn off um, uh, content security policy, your batch shield, uh, and that's great. That's kind of what I'm talking about by making security the default, is that by using Ember, you're probably going to have CSP on by default. Uh, and I think that's what we need to work towards. Like library authors need to help people by default have security and then opt out of it, rather than the other way around. Uh, SRI is a new acronym that we get to learn, uh, and that stands for sub-resource integrity. Uh, and so if you want to load, especially external domain scripts, uh, like jQuery from the CDN or Google Analytics from somewhere else, you can uh, add a hash and say, this script must match this hash. And if it gets changed, don't run it, uh, because I don't know what the change was, and I need to know what those changes are. Uh, and this sounds a little bit crazy, like, uh, why would I ever need to do that for the jQuery CDN? Um, but this is a copy of jQuery that I downloaded from my mobile phone while I was in London once. Uh, and it looks pretty normal. It looks like regular jQuery. Uh, but if you zoom in, it starts looking a little weirder. You might notice some weird stuff, specifically in this region here. That does not look like regular jQuery to me. There's a document right in there suddenly. I know jQuery isn't that silly. So uh, over HTTP connections, uh, that mobile network was injecting ads into every page that used jQuery on a CDN. And this would fail the CSP for those, or it would fail the SRI, the, the sub-resource integrity, because that script would no longer hash to the same URL that, or the same hash that it used to. I, I think that's uh, really great, especially for cross-domain things. Uh, you can actually reference a fallback script to say, like, if that script gets changed, load one locally, uh, which is kind of nifty. Uh, SRI is still a working draft, but uh, it's, it's shipped in Chrome, but there's a bug with UTF-8, uh, so figure it out. You can actually do an SRI hash generator if you don't want to figure out uh, what things hash do. You can kind of put in a URL and figure out the hash and then just use it. Uh, so you don't even need like fancy tooling, but there is fancy tooling. Uh, and you can come and like read these specs or contribute and say, like, I hate this or this is good. So good security goes beyond just preventing content injection. That's kind of what we've been talking about. But there are other measures that, that you can uh, use. Uh, HTTPS everywhere is something that, like, you should be using HTTPS, but I don't like HTTPS everywhere because it's not specific enough. Uh, I want HTTPS only. Like, you shouldn't have the HTTP version of your site. There's no reason to have it. It's not slower. You can get HTTPS uh, uh, certificates for free now, uh, and that's only going to get easier. So if, you, if someone hits your HTTP site, you should 301 them to your HTTPS site, uh, much like my website does, a, a beacon for all people to, I don't know. Uh, I really lost it there again. Another uh, good thing is once you do hit the HTTPS site, uh, add the strict transport security, which is uh, uh, HTTP STS, right? So uh, this is pinning. It says, even if someone, now that they've been to my website over HTTPS, even if someone tries to go to the HTTP page, immediately, don't even like let the request go through for the HTTP page, just bump them over to HTTPS. 
And that's a really good thing. It just set a max age on it because you're never ever going to serve anything over HTTP anymore, right? So that's HSTF. Um, and you can actually promise, like, you can give like the promise ring of promises uh, to be HTTPS forever if you want. There's this page, and it's pretty hidden in some mailing list uh, that it was posted on, but I happen to follow that very boring web security mailing list. And a Google engineer created this, and he said, if anyone wants to be in the Chrome pinned HSTS list, just add your domain here. And I think like three people initially did. I was one of them. Uh, <laughs> and it used to be that uh, if you were a big company, like Stripe uh, or, or something like that, you could ask Chrome to say, don't even wait for the first time that someone requests this in order to get my HSTS uh, header. Just never let anyone use Chrome to hit stripe.com over HTTP. And so Chrome actually has this built-in list of sites that are already forced HTTPS. Uh, and so I added alexexon.com, and it, at the time, was, it was like Dropbox, Stripe, Bank of America, alexexon.com. It was really great. <laughs> now it's cyber shambles, as prep, ad, I don't know, URL kitten. It's nice. Anyways, uh, this list is actually shared now by all the browsers. Uh, so IE and Firefox uh, and Safari all pull this list in separately, and so you cannot hit Alex Exton over HTTP anymore, which is cool. Dot com. Uh, Alex Exton dot com. Not me. You could hit me over HTTP, I guess. Uh, frame busting is another thing that is good to do. So we talked about that SVG hack. Uh, and one thing, unless you explicitly want to be iframed, if you're like the like button, you're like the like button. If you are the like button, you want to be an iframe in someone's page. But for the most part, I never want someone iframing stripe.com, I never want them iframing alexaxon.com. And so you can actually send uh, a header. And this header is uh, old, it, like xframe options has actually um, been replaced with CSP. So you should do it in CSP, but there's still plenty of browsers that this helps, and so you can still throw it in there. And the idea is that if we add all these different headers and we add these uh, different things and we lock everything down by default, we're secure by default and then we're opening up little holes. And so you can re rely a little less on being perfect every time uh, and try to just build web apps like you already want to do, as long as you have that good base. But it only matters if we all buy in, so don't mess with the web. Not good. So everyone turn on, please, Turn on all your security stuff, pretty please, with sugar on top. Uh, I don't actually have a good slogan for you. Uh, I have to talk to GSDNM about that, but thank you guys. <laughs>